I see the green card. Okay, thank you guys so much. It is uh, my sincere pleasure to welcome back our panel presentations and discussions. Our next panel is going to be on learning health systems in BC, a really exciting topic for many. And some of the presentations thus far over day one and day two have touched upon learning health systems. So this will be a great conversation to further that. Again, if you're online, please navigate to the next session on the panel on your left hand side. Um, and it is without further ado that I get to introduce Dr. Tibor Van Roy as moderator for the next session. And so Tibor is the Director of Research Informatics at the BC Children's Hospital Research Institute and also an adjunct professor at computer science at, sorry, at, of computer science at UBC. That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I will give you this microphone and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, so um, just a, uh, one, one uh, quick comment um, before uh, we get the panel. Um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here and, and to see how um, this Digital Health Week has grown. Um, I remember uh, Beth Payne started it in 2021 and it was much smaller and much more virtual. And um, then PHSA joined in uh, 2022 and now, now look at it. It's amazing. So thank you very much, Beth. This is really great. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, uh, I, I will introduce the panel. It's um, Jimmy and Lexi uh, that are coming up. And, um, and behind me will be Wakar and Shirley. And I will um, quickly let them introduce themselves, um, starting with the people. Hi, Wakar. Uh, starting with the people that are in the room, Jimmy and Lexi. So, Jimmy. Hello. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Jimmy Chan. I'm the manager of uh, quality analytics at Vancouver Coastal Health. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, Lexi Flatt. I'm the VP for data analytics at PHSA. What card? Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Wakar, Wakar Mughal. I am the program director for data at uh, the BC support unit at Michael Smith Health Research BC. And I'm Shirley Wong from the BC Ministry of Health. I, I, I'm go. leading on the health data platform. I should go this way. All right. Fantastic. Um, now we now we have the seating arrangement sorted. Um, we're talking today about what learning health systems may mean for the province of uh, BC, and I will I will ask uh, start with a question for for Wakar, who has an overview on learning health systems sort of all across um, Canada. What, what what could a learning health system mean for BC, Wakar? I think what I've seen across the country, both in talking to teams, but also to in, in some of the published uh, literature that's out there, there's a really great potential to create practices that are, by their very nature, always looking to improve practice, looking to improve performance, looking to improve the outcomes that we are looking for. So I think that the, the, the thing that I'm really excited about is that there's... Uh, there's opportunity to change the way that a lot of folks have been doing the work that they have been doing and maybe help help teams move in a direction to uh, more easily improve practice than you, the methods that have been used in the past to to improve or change practice. Thank you. Um, that, that That's important because what you said, it's like for you, a learning health system is improving practice. Um, Lexi, what does a learning health system mean to you? I, I think that's um, the the comment of it's not one and done is important. You know, I think a learning health system, it um, for for PHSA, um, what we've really focused on is uh, how do we kind of deal with the issue of the fact that quality is in retreat right now. That when we look around, we see you know, access issues, wait times increasing, we see um, outcomes declining, you know, uh, prevent people are not getting screened as much as they should anymore. They're not um, 
we're seeing more disparities. Um, we're seeing higher mortality rates. Certainly when we look at cancer and cardiac, we're seeing that. Um, we're seeing a workforce that's overburdened, uh, lots of turnover. Um, and so how do you really think about bringing value-based care is what everybody's talking about, right? And how do you do that in a way that you can start to address some of these issues? And I, I think really being careful in what you select to study and then just be, always being iterative. Um, our CEO, not that long ago, uh, spoke to all our leaders and said, you know, I, I don't want you people, I don't want the staff to be afraid of risk and afraid of failure. And, um, you know, healthcare is really built upon being risk averse. <laughs> so it's a, it's a learning health system gives you a little bit of space to uh, kind of look at things differently, not be afraid to fail, uh, try something, iterate on it. And so, yeah, I think for us, it's about, you know, continuous change and continuous learning. Um, and from a data perspective, it's about really utilizing the evidence and the data and, you know, driving it through that, through that force. Thank you. Um, Shirley, what is, what is, what is your view on a learning health system? And, and, and what, what do you see as, uh, as the issues with implementing one? I think the big thing for me is around the enabling infrastructure. Um, what, that's what sort of what's missing in terms of enabling the things that Lexi and Blackheart spoke of. How are you putting the enabling infrastructure to make it easy and commonplace? And it can't be off the side of someone's desk. So I'm, I'm hoping that that is an area that we move into more. Data is just one of those enabling infrastructure. And I think it's a big one. But we also need to look at how our, our governance structures work how we work collaboratively as a sector between organizations and among organizations. How do we come together in a virtual way to behave as one organization in that sense to support the work that we're talking about? Thank you for that. Jimmy, your view? Yeah, I, I think Lexi mentioned something about value-based healthcare. Um, so, that, so in VCH, um, the a learning health system is our interpretation of how do we get to a value-based healthcare system. Uh, so it's about iteration, collecting the data, uh, you know, working, engaging with the physician to uh, inform about their practice, and you know, working with them on including quality of care indicators, and uh, and then implementing life to ultimately see like a patient improvement in patient outcome. Um, it's an iterative process to us. Um, it's not a uh, one shot, you're done. Uh, we've been practicing this uh, um, this learning health system methodology, I would call it, um, since 2018, and we're still kind of like a ground roots growing thing. That it's like you know, we're trying to implement all, uh, across more uh, more discipline. So that's how we see it at VCH. And, and, and how, because this value-based um, system has been mentioned, could, could, could you tell us some more about what that means? What, what, what is value-based healthcare? For me, it's very simple. It's uh, uh, providing the best care at the lowest cost, you know, and I think that's kind of what value-based care is all about. Um, it's not a new concept at all. Uh, it's, we've been talking about it for a long time, but um, we haven't had... Uh, to be like coming from a data perspective, I don't think we've had the, as Shirley indicated, the infrastructure and the data to really drive some of that. And um, we're we're almost there now. You know, I think the tools, the technologies, the data matched with cl clinical people and operations. So you can't do it on its own. It has to really come together collectively. Um, you know, that's where the magic comes in, providing that low cost, high value. And then, and then the ability to, to fail, I'm in research, so I fail a lot. Um, <laughs> we, we try things and sometimes it works and no is an answer too, I always say. Um, but um, so, so are there, do you know of any examples um, in BC where, where people are, are experimenting with this currently? No, with, with, with learning health systems and, and, and related to value-based value care, because the two are clearly intertwined. 
And I guess it depends on where in the cycle you are. And I don't want to take over for some of our, our speakers here, but- um, I know the car also has an example. Yeah, um, uh, certainly um, one place that we started very early on um, really uh, is on that whole journey. So the learning health system is data to knowledge, knowledge to practice, practice to data. And so the first piece really is around you know, your data and the fitness of your data, and can you use your data for purposes of trying to learn and improve a system? Um, and so one of the areas that we looked at was cancer. And um, we produce through BC Cancer, it's a program of PHSA, we, we produce uh, um, surveillance data and look at um, uh, incidents of, of um, cancer um, across uh, British Columbia and compare that to uh, national rates. And we saw that our um, kidney, invasive kidney cancer rates were substantially lower than the, uh, the rest of the country. And, um, and our rates were actually kind of declining, whereas the rest of the country was really seeing an increase in rates. And so, you know, we could think, well, we're a healthy, healthy population and this is all great, but something didn't seem right. So we audited some of our data and certainly when we audited it, we found that our rates were actually much closer to the national national average. Um, and so that's where we started. We started at, okay, how can we improve the quality, the fitness of our data to, so that we can start to use it and start to, 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 to learn from it and to improve upon it. And so we actually started with NLP, um, natural language processing, and mined a lot of data and, um, and relied a lot less on historic information, more on clinical notes. And um, we've been able to improve our accuracy, improve our timeliness, and, um, and really get that data much uh, more recent so that we can use it for a learning health system. So we're in the very first part of that journey, which is just trying to understand the data and turn that data into knowledge. Um, we certainly, um, we, we have lots of projects where we're digging into it, but that's been the first part and it's been a very iterative part. Um, we tried a lot of different ways to use the NLP and we failed in some cases um, and we were successful in some cases. So uh, we kind of built off of our successes, but it was definitely you know, a focus on the data quality piece in order to help to inform the, the learning health system. That's that's a great that's a great example, and and in computer science we call it ego garbage in garbage out, right? Like so, you need to make sure that the data you start from is 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 correct. Um, Bokar, do you have an example of uh, a learning health system project in action in BC or elsewhere? Um, the, well, we had we have two of them. One of them is just kind of starting, um, and we're we're in discussions about moving it to the next stage. And it had to do with uh, data that we had looked at uh, between uh, HealthLink BC and um, the NACRS database inside um, the, uh, well, inside the health data platform is where we did the analysis. So the platform that Shirley is supporting and leading. And I think that, that one of the things that we recognized, and this is also true of the other um, uh, project that we, we read about in Ottawa that looked at uh, our cardiovascular fitness uh, prehab rehab program, uh, virtual program. The patients were identified as the population of interest, and they were really good. Both teams were really good at identifying what what we needed to do uh, for that population. But the gap that we saw was uh, the patient involvement in the project itself. So B the BC Support Unit is a SPORE-funded entity. It's a strategy for patient-oriented research, and it's a CIHR program, and we've been doing that work since about 2015. In this phase of work that we're now moving into where we're supporting and promoting learning health systems practices, we are uh, paying close attention to the involvement of patients and patient partners and people with uh, people and patients and people with uh, lived and living experiences. Uh, in that work process, so not just being a target of the work um, and subjects of the learning health system, but actually a uh, party in the project team so that they help to define what are the measures that are going to be important. We have a lot of administrative data. We have a lot of clinical data that we can clean up. And Lexi's absolutely right. We have to look at the quality of the data because a lot of the data is put in without uh, thinking about how it's going to be used at the other end, which is a whole nother, which is the issue that we run into. 
but also understanding what are the the concerns that the the patients and and our, our other partners have with the the practice that that we're trying to improve what are the outcomes that we should be focusing on how do we interpret the findings um the the our, our patient partners are going to help us understand the outcomes a little bit better and that will lead to a better experience so the quadruple aim is going to be absolutely about the best care at the right time at the lowest cost it's also about the experience of the the that the patient has as well as the experience of the staff the teams that deliver that care um, and we're also very interested in equity so there's there's pockets of examples of where we're linking good data and it's closing the loop on uh, work practices or, or care practices, uh, but we still have a ways to go in terms of patient engagement and patient involvement. Shirley, do you have any other examples of this? No, my Not examples would be my examples would be more related to the data journey itself, and and just elaborating on the points that Whitecard and and Lexi have made. I hope people realize that a lot of our data assets were not originally collected to support what we're talking about today. They're either from yeah. payment systems, transactional environments, and we're now we're moving into an area of using these assets for these other purposes. And also as we digitize more assets, we'll have more of it. And I think the real journey next is around that data quality piece. How do we build infrastructure in place to support responsible use as we work to democratize that access. And I think that's a real part of our journey as well, to effectively and responsibly support the learning health system and really understand what our limitations of our data are. How do we bring um, new technology like uh, Lexi mentioned around NLP? How do we leverage that? And the other side of it is how do we bring in other forms of data? So right now we've largely talked about tabular data. What about other data sources such as images, sound, uh, genomics data, for example, how do we build an interoperable uh, asset across organization, across forms to support these types of work? Well, I don't have a specific example about learning health system. I'm using this as an example also to understand the continuous improvements that we have to make on our assets and enable an infrastructure to support the work. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm now going to... Um... Uh, get some uh, questions from the audience that is um, online. Um, what are the best prax practices you would recommend for getting buy-in to data sharing agreements that, are, that allow for these type of analytics? Um, how providers and patients have a lot of fear about how their data is being used. So, so how, how, what are some strategies to, to overcome that or to work together to? It, um, definitely it's uh, engagement, engagement, engagement to me. Um, so uh, uh, in the uh, model that I was talking about, uh, it, it's called integrated practice unit. Actually, um, we actually have every single unit that are participating in this project actually have a physician lead at Rich. We actually partner with them. We have, a, we have a patient experience coordinators or their uh, a division head to make sure that we are coordinating with them so that everything is transparent uh, to everyone who is uh, participating, of course. Um, it also is, uh, it also even goes down to the funding of how we actually practice the uh, integrated practice unit because it's actually, like you actually, we actually have, um, uh, before we start the project, we actually have an assessment with the uh, if physician and also like uh, different areas that are involved, it's like are these are is this group of practitioner actually ready to drive change for the organization? Now with that as the first gate, and then we get to the funding model, and then we get to the once their funding model, uh, you know, make sure that there are the physical engagement, the appropriate resources are there. Then we get to the data of whether it's actually available. Because once all those like pillars are set up, it's much easier, much, much easier to start about data sharing. So I'm kind of like going around the problem a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a topic we could probably talk about for a long time. It's complicated. It's, uh, fundamentally, it's about trust um, and um, being able to trust the people you're working with, how they're gonna use the data, how they're gonna translate the data. Um, how the data is going to be applied. So I think trust is foundational. Um, there's a big piece about data where people feel that they personally own it. 
um, and, you know, this, this is my data and, you know, um, you can't touch my data. And I think we really have to uh, really challenge that with people. Um, the data is the patient's data. Um, nobody owns the data other than the patient. We always have to remind ourselves about that. We've been really trying to push that concept at PHSA around ownership that uh, you're, you're a custodian or a steward of this data, but you don't own the data. And we always have to look at the best, you know, what's, what is the use of this data and what are we trying to do with it? Um, it's, but it's hard. I think um, one thing that is really important and that we've tried to infuse in our uh, learning health system is uh, data governance around indigenous data um, and really trying to think about how, uh, how we work um, alongside and with indigenous people to, to really address uh, anti-racism and um, just cultural safety issues that we have. So I think, you know, I, I think the whole issue around data sharing among indigenous people is very challenging and is something that you really need to work hard at. And um, yeah, I, I, th I think that's probably the toughest area to work in just because of the misuse and the mistrust of data. Um, but um, yeah, I think we need to push the limits on it and uh, always be pushing the use of it uh, for better patient outcomes. And then it's hard to argue. Car, would you like to comment on the same trust issues? Yeah, I think I, I've seen that many, many times. Uh, it just in the work that I've done over the years. I think it um, it goes to something you said earlier, Tibor, about uh, garbage in, garbage out. Not not quite like that, but um, I think that there's very little consideration. Not very little. I think it's it's rare to have uh, consideration made to a data system at the outset of. Um, of thinking, how is this data going to be used uh, once it's been put in place? I think the primary focus is how do we get the data in there? How do we make sure it's coded properly? How do we make sure that if I look back at it, I understand it? And the, it doesn't necessarily translate very well to how do I use this to understand how well this program is running or how well the, the patients are experiencing their care or, or how their outcomes are. So I think that part of our challenge, part of the trust issue is believing the data. Um, more often than not, first time a team looks at their data being processed in a report, the very first time they see it, they won't believe it because it won't necessarily represent their uh, what they believe is their lived experience in uh, in the unit or on, in the uh, environment. So I think it just does depend on what the concerns are. Like, is it good data? Is it bad data? Is it going to look at, make us look bad? Is it going to be something that um, is is going to highlight our processes that are either working really well or, or not. So I think it it, uh, it is always worth a conversation. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that the best way to get a team's buy-in in terms of the value of data and and believing and trusting in the data is to is to share it with them. And like I said, the first time is always the most difficult. But if people can see how the data that they put in, it can be used and should be used to help understand how well um, their their services are being delivered and, and the outcomes of the, of the patients that are receiving the care. They, it has a, an opportunity to influence people's perspectives on, you know, how much attention they pay to the data that gets put in there and, uh, and the, the quality can improve in that sense as well. And then just generally speaking, being more aware of the whole process. The trust, uh, the trust can uh, be developed ongoing. Can I just add uh, on to that? Um, I think that just I think that you made some really good points. Um, it reminded me of a, a long time ago. We did a we were setting funding rates for cardiac procedures, and it was case mix adjusted. And so the very first step we started with was on data quality, and we went to all of the cardiac surgeons and the interventionalists and said, "This is the prevalence of your." of your factors, uh, n nothing about funding, just this is the prevalence. And um, you know, one of the physicians said, there's no way our pacemaker rate is this high, like this is wrong. And uh, so we went 
went back, looked at the data, and of course, somebody had coded the data, temporary pacemaker is a permanent pacemaker, and so it turned up that way. So it was, a, it was a coding issue, it wasn't real. We were able to adjust that data, but that sitting down with clinicians, sitting down with operations, and really validating your data is so important to creating that trust. And then just building on that point, when you're showing data and you're showing results and you're showing performance, like you don't always have to show people or hospitals or names, like read your room. And if people are open and transparent, then sure, you can have that discussion. But a lot of times, like, you know, just present the data, present the variants, don't present the good and the bad. And you'll, you'll, get, you'll get somewhere in the discussion. And maybe next time you'll get to, you know, where's the good and where's the bad. But it, it is a bit of a journey. And I think you have to read, you have to read who you're working with and see where they're at. And, and it goes, you know, to, back to trust, but like it goes to comfort in the data too. So. And, and, and like you said, meet people at where they currently are at and, and, and not necessarily try to do too many things at the same time. I like the concept that Wakar um, touched on and, and you actually called it dem democratization of data. Um, and, and I wonder, um, because uh, surely you also said sometimes the data is not good. Does that mean that in a learning health system, we, we should maybe recontact patients and, 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 and get better data? I'm not what? necessarily saying that. I'm saying that we should understand the limitations of its use, right? And I think the practicality of what you're suggesting is, is not there. And, and, and how do we... How do we better understand what we have to continue to use it? But I wonder, is it all right if I go back to the other question that Lexi and Weikart was answering? Um, what I wanted to say is, I, I hope that we can understand that there are three perspectives and it's, appreciate, it's important to understand being in each other's shoes. And the three perspectives I wanna talk about are data contributors, data consumers, and the public. The data contributors, their issues are around privacy and meeting our labor. Requirements. I think we really have to appreciate where they're coming from in order from their fiduciary responsibilities as holders of the data to make it useful. So in that per part of the world, we are doing a lot of work at the ministry around a collective governance model. And the value is our collections together, not as individual organizations. If we want to build a longitudinal record, it's all of our contributions together. So how can we work together collectively to have shared policies and agreements that work to, to interconnect ourselves in order to share that data. From a data consumer perspective, you know, I get the I get the demand on the table. Why can't I have it faster? Why can't I have it tomorrow? And I think there's some responsibilities on the data consumer because there's concerns around some of the issues that Lexi and Weikart has already raised around the potential for harm. And I'm not talking about harm from the privacy perspective, but harm from an organizational perspective, the negative that could come from the change. What processes and policies are we collectively putting in place to work together to build that trust? Okay. And on the public side, how do we increase that literacy to understand the values of the work that we're trying to do so that we can reduce this fear and uncertainty? Thank you. That, that was great. I just wanted to go to your point, your question, because just to be a bit provocative, wouldn't it be really cool if like your healthcare was kind of like your pictures somewhere in iCloud and you as a patient had the ability to go in and edit it and change it and add it, add to it, um, or you and your GP manage that, you know? I mean, I think that we as patients, can, individuals, have no idea what's in our in our patient record, you know? And wouldn't it be interesting if we had some way of being able to to have a view into it, to have a have a perspective into it, to be able to add to it, to be able to have a conversation with our GP around it. I, I think um, that is something from a patient perspective that we definitely need to, to see. Yeah, I, I think that would also greatly increase that trust because I, I, I now, myself as a patient, I'm, I'm collaborating with you on, on, on my health. Um, um, is there a, a, I want to open, oh, yes, perfect. There are questions in the room.
Yes, so I'm a patient partner. This is not about data specifically. Um, when we get engaged in learning health network and how it's framed, we really want to make sure it's going to move forward and all that kind of thing. But, but we live in a broader context. We live with our determinants of health and uh, um, so it's, so our thinking is, is broader. It's just like, okay, how did I manage before? How am I going to manage after? Is the learning health network going to actually support me in doing that? And how can you bring that in? And I'll use, just use an example. I'm helping province with, with hospital at home. And a lot of the discussions been been, you know, what's the team going to do? Uh, the technology, virtual monitoring at home. And I said, well, what are you going to do the first day when, when, you know, when, the, when the patient goes and, you're, and the nurse is going to go in? Oh, we're going to show them again how to use the, the equipment. I said, well, no. You start by actually in the hospital establishing the relationship. And when you go home, you say, how are you doing? I know you just got home. Uh, is, you know, what can I do for you? All that kind of stuff. So, so what I'm saying is that um, yeah, as patients, I mean, we really want to actually help. We really want to you know, get that done. But our, our thinking is, is broader in that way. So, um, so for me, a learning health network has to be able to be framed and to be able to capture a, sort of that broader perspective. And, and to give patients permission to actually sort of broaden it. And some patients are better than others at that. So you almost lead, need a section in the learning health network to kind of say, you know, what is the, the patient's perspective and experience? And then what outcomes are we going to look at? And we talk about that, but in my experience, we're not quite there yet. So that's more reflection, but if people want to comment on that, that's fine too. Yeah, I could comment a little bit on that. Um... So uh, in the uh, model that we use at VCH, and although it's very small, um, we actually have what we call an experiencing care team, which is actually uh, working with the patient and the provider and um, actually understand their, like, their experience, really. And how we actually have been piloting to do this uh, at a very small scale is actually instead of doing like, you know, mass blast surveys of what patient actually looks, uh, you know, what they're feeling is actually on selective cases, do in just selectly do in-depth interviews, one hour interviews with patient and their families and actually try to understand, you know, truly understand what they need, uh, what their experience with, uh, you know, with the provider um, and, and, and then also the, um, um, the, this, the, uh, the care itself. Now that actually gets feedback into the value-based healthcare model. Uh, the value-based healthcare model, one very important model, uh, part of it is actually patient experience. Uh, it's actually one of the four major pillars. And that is how we actually try to uh, uh, do this. Whether it's completely scalable, we are still trying to figure it out because it's, uh, you know, you can't, you know, as an organization or uh, we can't really do one hour interview to every single patient uh, and their family. So we would, but it's something that it's definitely uh, heard and acknowledged and heard, and we're trying to work on it. Yeah, they're, they're, so so we refer that sometimes sometimes part of that as as prems and proms, which patient uh, patient um, experiences and and outcome measurements that you are trying to capture along alongside the data because it's actually a very very important part how did people experience their care what did they feel and 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 what was the end result of it all there, there, no but like sorry i'll repeat it like if if, if you are going to frame it you need to do it in a, in a more holistic way is, is what you're saying yeah correct and if i yeah and can I can I just add to that that statement as well, Tibor? The idea that um, you know, with patient engagement within the learning health systems models that we're we're supporting, it, the hope <laughs> would be that those those elements of those aspects would be captured or identified, uh, would be identified at the design stage or at the nascent stage of the learning health system, so that the broadness or the 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 breadth of the types of information that is necessary to get a fulsome 
uh, picture of what is happening in that care team or with the, the, the patients that are receiving care in that care environment would be identified at that set and you would be able to capture that as you move forward and then also help with the interpretation as well right like if you have poor performance does that mean that that has uh, that ha must be fixed or is it an indicator of you know, where other things need to be uh need to be addressed thank you akar um i i just want to could, could that gentleman get a oh you have it oh fantastic and it's on. Ah. Uh, first, I want to thank you for acknowledging that the system has problems. I'm, I work with some really wonderful people in the in PHSA, but I've never heard anybody verbalize what patients know intuitively and actually that things are tough and 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 we need to uh, improve. Well, everybody says we need to improve, but actually saying the words, the metrics are going down. Thank you. First thing to get trust is to earn it. And saying how it is is one way. I've spent a fair amount of time in the not-for-profit sector, and one of the things we've done is looking for the low-hanging fruit. I, I, well, I'll suggest, I can suggest, I'll suggest that we look at everything that can possibly be done with just a phone call. I talk to my cardiologist, I have a home blood pressure monitor. I talk to my cardiologist on the phone and I'm on Gabriel Island cardiologist in Victoria. So that's a, it works a lot better than me going to Victoria, but I wonder if anyone has just really focused on how much can we do on the telephone? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess that's the theme of this week is about, you know, how do we try and move away from traditional ways of, of being and, do, and doing? Um, I don't think phone works all the time, you know, I, um, but I agree. There's simple solutions that we, we sometimes overcomplicate things. Um, and um, I, I do agree with uh, the gentleman before his comment around, like, we don't really think about it from a patient perspective most of the time and the journey and the life that you're living and what you want to do and how you want to live and how that solution fits in we kind of focus in in our little silos and that's tough and um, we're so busy and that's kind of, you know, we're just trying to get our stuff done and um, you lose that vision. So times like now and input from, from not-for-profit and patients, and those are all really good perspectives to remind you of what you're really doing and why you're in the business that you're doing, but keep it simple, right? That's, that's uh, yeah, I agree, yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Douglas Adams, um, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you took computer science, you know this book. Um, um, but uh, Douglas Adams once famously said, and I, I, I always think of this, is like, unfortunately, we're stuck with technology when all we really want is stuff that works. So... Um, the only thing that I would say is I read a really good book that maybe other people might have read called Deep Medicine. And um, it's really about um, AI and how AI can really tr transform healthcare. But it, the premise of the book is about how to make healthcare human again and how to use AI to actually, you know, take physicians away from their computer screens and put them in front of the patients. And uh, how do we start to leverage some of that technology to bring that to, to surface? Uh, it's a great book. Um, and I think it has some, you know, war good warnings about AI, and I think we need to be careful about it, but it also gives you a bit of hope that, you know, maybe we will, maybe all of this technology will actually really bring the human emotion out of us and allow us to, to bring a different kind of healthcare in the future. Thank you for that. That was, that was great. Um, I, I'm going to take um, uh, a question from the... Um, online audience, and uh, I'm actually going to combine two questions. Um, what advice do you have for partners around using data in different purposes than it was originally collected for? And how can we improve our existing data governance structures in BC? And that's that 
that maybe may not be the best for this panel. And it also underlines that whenever you do anything in healthcare, and uh, the closer you get to patients, the, the bigger all of a sudden the team becomes. Like complexity and, and, and closeness to point of care seem to go hand in hand. So um, who wants to, um, to start answering that? Shirley, do you want to answer anything on the data governance and, and, and how to use data for different purposes than it was originally collected for? And well, I, I think that's more the boundaries of that. Like, So I'll start with the first one around um, improving our data governance structures in BC. It goes back to that early conversation around trust and, and related to that is the transparency piece and what I said earlier around collective governance. We've been doing a lot of work around how we can streamline access. So there's a particular project that we're looking on now is streamlining the whole research approval process from ethics to organizational approvals, to data access, to privacy, to contracts. So we are beginning to look at how we can address that in a more holistic way and the entire journey. And the other thing is around building our trust is how do we spin down common policies or shared processes in place so that we are streamlining and uh, making it more clear to data consumers how the process actually works. So that means publishing more things, being uh, less of a black box uh, as we've been criticized to be around. What are some of the rules of engagement? How can I be better informed around my choices? So if I make choice A, it may take this long, but if I add these additional pieces to it, it may add this much more time to the process. With respect to using data that Dennis was his original form, one of my hopes is that we can begin to better document the limitations and be able to share that knowledge way more broadly than we currently do today. A knowledge right now is literally limited to the person who's doing the analysis. Going back to my point around the enabling infrastructure, we're not documenting and sharing it like a community. So that person doing the wrangling the first time hopefully don't have to do it again or can learn from the data wrangling that someone else has done. Related to that is around methodologies. I'm sure we all want a definition of what a diabetic is. Could we share some of these definitions from a technical point of view? And what I mean by that is perhaps it's the, the drugs that were taken, the disease, the procedure list, and use that as a beginning point around aligning some of our methodological procedures. And basically just plain old education. How do we build up more materials so that we're more informed of how we can better support responsible use? That is a long journey, what I've described. And I hope that with some of the enabling infrastructure that would make it easier to support the collection of this and to also uh, impress upon analysts that the value, the greater value is to work towards open working around the sharing better than working by ourselves. Thank you. Um, we, we, we have time for one more question. I, I have a good one from the at home audience. But if there's somebody here, okay. Um, so so to to go further to what you just said, Shirley, like where does the data live, and and does industry have access? Because that is that is sort of like we haven't addressed that yet. But what is the role of business or industry in in, in this, if any? I think that's a complicated answer in the sense that mm -hmm. industry is involved in. Does Lexi want to go for it? No, you go. No, no, go. I was going to, I was going to say industry is involved indirectly in some of our research. So what we're trying to do is to keep the research analysis as publicly available as possible. So it's not to the advantage of industry. So we are supporting industry funded research in that kind of way. Um, I, I think I'll stop there. I'll let Lexi take over from here. So I'm not nearly as conservative as Shirley. So I think there absolutely is a role for industry, um, 100%. And uh, we need to we need to get it out there. Um, uh, we worked with um, a clinician at St. Paul's Hospital who worked with an industry partner uh, with regards to transapical transcatheter transapical catheter vet. Uh, aortic valve implants, transcatheter aortic valve implants, new technology. And um, we used our data at the time. We anonymized it. We used it. 
Uh, we were able to understand the population for which this new technology could um, apply to patients in British Columbia. We became international leaders in that, uh, that technology. Uh, we were able to negotiate significant discounts even to this day in the price of the devices. Um, we have um, made that technology available to all of uh, British Columbia much earlier than any other jurisdiction. We've also forged into new areas of uh, technologies around transcatheter uh, technologies for uh, cardiac interventions. And that was because we had the data, we worked with industry, and we were able to push that, that technology forward in a collaborative way. So um, we will make healthcare better, we will make it cheaper, um, and, uh, and we will become an innovative uh, province if we work with industry. We can't do it on our own. We don't have the capability, the cap capacity, and we don't have the technology. We do need to leverage um, our industry partners in, in creative uh, and intelligent ways. It's not to open up all our data and say, here, go for it, um, but we really, we really need to open it up to our industry partners uh, to work with us. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for this particular session, but um, we're, we're all going to be here for a little bit longer, so um, you can talk to us in the hallways. Thank you.